Hello and welcome back. Um, this is uh, lect the part one of lecture 10 uh, for the computational neuroscience course, uh, Systems 552, Biology 487, taught at the University of Waterloo in the winter of 2021. Um, and now we're going to get into intermediate level visual processing. Um, so we're building on what we talked about in the last lecture. Um, and We'll be focusing on fairly small networks um, uh, of neurons, um, but we're sort of going to be trying to build up from uh, the low-level visual processing that we talked about in the last class, where we sort of identified, well, what are the very, very first neurons in the visual system? Um, what sort of features are they extracting from the visual input? Uh, for readings, it's the Candle et al. textbook again, uh, chapter 27. All right, what are we talking about here? So we talked a lot about going from the raw data coming in from the eyes, the raw image coming into the eyes, a um, bunch of processing going on in the retina, and then the ganglion cells sending a signal back to V1. Um, and the sort of the sort of features that it's sending back, so it's not taking the raw image and just saying, okay, what's the brightness at each point on the screen? Um, like just sort of that would be sort of the raw input um, that we would feed to a normal neural network or just if we were storing an image somewhere instead the signal that's coming back has we talked about these receptive field sort of things these center surround receptive fields and the idea is that the particular features that are being extracted are at a bunch of different points in the field of view um, we have a feature that, or a particular ganglion cell, that will be very active if there is something going on in the center area. So if I have a bright light in the center area um, and I have darkness around it, that'll be the best, the, the stimulus that most causes this neuron to fire or that causes this feature to have the largest value. Okay. Um, uh, and it'll certainly it'll have some, you know even, even if this was all bright light the feature would have some value it just wouldn't be as large a value or the neuron would be firing as quickly as if it was bright in the center and dark around um, and there are both on and off versions of this so there are also other neurons or other features that are looking for um, a dark spot in the middle and brighter around and when we talked about in the last class how this happens in the retina this is happening like right as the very first processing that the retina is doing, um, we sort of have this difference between, um, well, there is an actual photoreceptor, you know, there is an actual thing in the retina that is detecting light at some locations, um, and, there, and that's sort of a nice feed-forward simple process. But then all of this sort of, oh, and also is the, you know, is it dark nearby? That seemed to be driven by a lot of these lateral connections and connections from from other nearby um, uh, parts of the retina that we're feeding in. Um, so one terminology that sort of comes up here and then becomes more important as we get deeper into the brain um, is some people will call the... You know, the thing that is actually driven by the forward connections, the stuff that we're used to, the stuff that we are doing in our normal artificial neural networks, um, uh, that's what we call the classical receptive field, um, sort of the raw sen sensory sort of information. Um, but then the stuff that is coming from the side, the stuff that is coming from, oh, this is feedback from other features, um, things that we don't typically do in an artificial neural network, um, people call that non-classical receptive fields. Um, or some sort of modulatory input. Okay, but this is the core idea that this is the feature that is being pulled out um, uh, from from the images and sent to the V1. Um, so, and there's one important, so one big difference about this that we have not seen in the artificial neural networks is the fact that there is these um, sideways connections that one feature is affecting other features. Um, whereas all of the features we looked at in the, or most of the features we looked at in the artificial neural network um, chunk um, did not have lateral connections like that. One other thing that's going to come up a little bit later, but I should at least mention it now, is biology is even more complicated than that. Um, the actual biology of the brain doesn't just have inputs, you know, coming in from the vision, 
um, and then these lateral connections such that features are connect or influencing other features. There's also top-down influences. In other words, there's also um, influences from um, the rest of the brain that also affect the activity of these neurons, so that also affect these, fe these feature neurons. Um, I'm not going to get it too much detail right now. Um, might come up later. One of the most important ones of these top-down things is sort of attention. Um, so, for example, if I have a neuron that is sensitive to lights, a bright light at one particular point in my visual field, it turns out if you tell people to pay attention to that area, so you're looking straight ahead and say, okay, I've got a neuron that that um, is sensitive to some particular point on your right, I'm telling you keep looking straight ahead, but then I tell you, but pay attention to what's on your right, even though you're still looking straight ahead. Um, you will actually find that that neuron starts to fire a little bit more, is a little bit more sensitive to um, to that light. Um, so, in other words, the feature in the um, in the you know, if we were sitting down and doing the math of okay, um, what causes this neuron to fire in our in our normal neural networks, it'd be just sort of oh, we've got raw input, we multiply the input by some weights that tells us. Um, you know, uh, and then we have some nonlinearity that tells us the activity of that neuron. Um, this sideways connection is also now saying that, oh, and um, also do a little bit of math based on your neighbors, the other features. Um, and then I've got this other thing saying, oh, and also add into that um, whether or not I'm currently paying attention to that point in the visual field. Um, so similar-ish idea, um, but the, the fact that the, the actual inputs to this sort of weighted sum that's going into my neuron um, starts having a lot more things in it, so it's a little bit trickier to understand. Um, okay. But the core things we're going to focus on right now are, hey, look, we have this sort of receptive field. We have this sort of feature coming into our system, coming into V1. Um, uh, what are we going to do with it? Um, and one thing that does often get done with it um, is fine, we've got these center surround features, can we make more complex features out of that? And when we look at the neural activity of neurons in V1, some of them are doing the center surround thing, but some of them are doing other stuff. Um, the center surround issues that we were just talking about, um, that was about the ganglion, about the data coming from the retina to V1, but V1 right away is going to do something slightly different about it. And in particular, what one think, what the, the idea is going to be is that the features that the retina are detecting um, are pretty fixed. Uh, that seems to be just, look, this is just what the biology says. This is the features that we're going to extract. I can't, in, during my lifetime, learn to, like, I don't know, have more neurons at different parts of my eye. Or, or oh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of color on my left, so therefore I should have more um, cones uh, on the left side of my visual field. Um, that sort of learning doesn't seem to happen, but there does seem to be learning happening at V1. Um, and one, um, and it's also the sort of learning with all these artificial neural networks, when we, if we train up artificial neural networks and you go ahead and look at what features they end up learning for that first layer, um, you end up getting things that look an awful lot like V1. Um, so the idea would be if I take up a neural network and train it up on a bunch of images, like the one we're seeing here, um, and then if we go ahead and look at each neuron and sort of see, okay, what's the stimulus that causes this neuron to fire more? Um, so what feature is this neuron extracting? Um, we get these little pictures over here on the right. Um, so, and, and what, we're, what we're showing here is what is the ideal stimulus that will call, cause this neuron to fire the most? Um, and we're assuming that each neuron has some small little receptive field um, uh, in, the, in the visual area. Um, and the neurons themselves are actually all over the place because this, this, is, this particular example is a convolutional network. So the idea is there's going to be one neuron for each of these patterns. But then, or for each of these patterns, there's a neuron at this location, and then at this location, and at this location, and this location, and this location, and so on. 
That's just how convolutional neural networks are set up. But then if we go ahead and look at what each of those neurons is looking for, we get things like this. And we get things like, oh, this neuron is sensitive to horizontal lines. Um, or this neuron is sensitive to lines at an angle. Or this neuron, you know, um, at sort of at different angles. Um, or, or the end point of a line, so a line that goes for a while and then stops. So these are the sorts of features that seem to be coming out of our artificial neural networks. And they turn out to be exactly the sorts of features that um, the neurons in V1 seem to be sensitive to. So how does that work? Core idea is going to be pretty simple, is that from the retina, so the retina and the, uh, the ganglion cells in the retina, the signal that's coming into there, those are neurons that have these sorts of center surround features. Um, but then I'm saying that in V1, we have neurons that are, say, more sensitive to something like this. So it's like, okay, I'm sensitive to bright lights along a big line, um, but then darkness are in, in this wider area. Okay. Um, well, you can build that up by just imagining, all right, well, let's say I had four, four ganglion neurons that just happen to be sort of positioned in this way, um, and we have all of them excite this one V1 neuron. Okay. So now the activity of this V1 neuron, the, the situation where it's going to get the most active, the most input, is going to be, well, if there's a dot here but nothing around, and a dot here and there's nothing around, and a dot here and there's nothing around, and a dot here and nothing around, and it won't quite be perfect because if I have a continuous bar, um, then yeah, there's going to be some brightness in this intermediate areas. Uh, but overall, this is the sort of thing that'll do the best job of stimulating this next neuron. Um, and indeed, this is exactly what sort of the very early experiments in studying the uh, visual cortex of animals, this is exactly what they did, is they just sort of took different bars of different shapes and waved them around in front of a... Um, this was mostly done at cats. Um, and they would... You know, move the bar around, so there's going to be some point in the visual field that this neuron is sensitive to, um, but then also what angle is the line at. Um, and over here you get some recordings of, okay, well if I play around, if I move up, put a line here, this neuron, this V1 neuron doesn't fire at all. If I make, if I twist it a little bit, it fires a little bit more, twist it a little bit, then there'll be some angle at which, oh, hey, look, the neuron fires a fair bit here. And then I twist it too far, it goes back to not firing at all. So this is what we sort of mean when we say, hey, look, this is a neuron, this V1 neuron is most sensitive to a line at this particular angle. It's still going to be sensitive to other lines, um, but that's going to be um, the thing that makes it excited the most. And it's a pretty easy, we can, we can pretty easily make um, or build up neurons that do this just by connecting them to a few of the, the uh, ganglion neurons coming from the retina. Um, and then the idea is going to be that this seems to be something that might be useful uh, because if you have a bunch of neurons like this, so if I have, um, say I have uh, a bunch of neurons that are each sensitive to different angles, and so these are all neurons that are sensitive to the same point in the visual field, or extracting you know, a particular feature from this particular point in the visual field, but each one is sensitive to um, a different angled line. Okay. And what you'll generally see is that if we actually give it a stimulus of a nice vertical line, this one will, this neuron will fire the most, this neuron will fire least, or fire a little less, this one will be a little less, and these outer ones will fire pretty much not at all. Um, and then the hope would be that this sort of information is something that we could then pass on to later groups of neurons that could then build up some sort of information about, okay, well, if this is, you know, given this particular pattern, I can get a pretty good idea about what I'm actually seeing. Um, or at least these can be then features that can then be used by the next layer of processing, much like in the deep neural network sort of idea. Cool. Um, when we go ahead and look in V1, we actually we see exactly these sorts of things. Um, we also see things a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so, for instance, we might have have neurons that are sensitive to, say, either a vertical line or a horizontal line. Um, all sorts of other possibilities. Um, and we can imagine building that up 
using the same sorts of structures we've seen before as just sort of um, you know, building layers of just each feature is computing a weighted sum of the earlier features. Um, so for instance, if I have different groups of ganglion cells that are sort of grouped in these sorts of ways, and I say, oh, okay, um, uh, and what, I, what this animation is showing is I'm giving different stimuli and showing the different stimuli's effects to, on each of these neurons. Um, but for that vertical line, okay, that causes this, so this neuron here is only sensitive, only fires um, when we get a vertical line at this point in the field. This one is only when we have an angled line, and this one is only when we have a horizontal line. That's sort of what we're seeing with this animation. But then we might have more complex cells, and yes, that is the terminology, simple cells and complex cells. Um, the more complex cells might be something like, oh, okay, I'll take input from multiples of these. Um, so this, this complex cell, for instance, is firing if I have a, a vertical line or a horizontal line or an angled line, any of those is, would be sufficient for this one to fire. Okay. Um, again, but again, the idea is that we're just building it up by um, um, connecting layers of neurons exactly the same way that we would do with sort of multi-layer perceptrons. Um, just we have features, we have, do some sort of weighted inputs to our next layer to make new features and new features. Same idea. Um, cool. Um, so that part seems pretty much okay, straightforward. That's um, at least similar-ish to what we've been seeing in these sort of feedforward standard artificial neural networks. Um, but this lateral thing that, that we saw in the retina also ends up happening in V1. Um, and it seems to be happening in lots of different ways, um, but one particular way um, that seems to be pretty common is that if you have neurons that are sensitive to nearby locations in space, so that's what we're plotting here, is we have a bunch of different neurons. Um, they're, um, they're each, these are all neurons that are sensitive to different locations in space. Um, but they're, and they're, but they're say all sensitive to uh, horizontal lines. So all of these neurons are sensitive to horizontal lines. Um, and so we can see things like, oh, okay, fine. If I actually gave this weird dotted pattern with lines all over the place, um, and I happen to have three lines in a row um, that are sort of lined up, um, then fine, that'll stimulate these three neurons. These ones won't get much stimulation because they're not, um, they're, so these, these neurons are not going to be very active because the input doesn't match what they're looking for. But there's this interesting thing that biology is doing is that these neurons that are for different that are looking for horizontal lines but at different locations in space seem to excite each other. So that means the feature that's being detected isn't just am I seeing a horizontal line at this location, but it's also am I seeing a horizontal line at this location, or is the horizontal lines kind of nearby? Um, and the idea is that this sort of information, um, what it can do is it can help um, help us really pick out um, uh, that there's some sort of continuous line happening here. It makes it makes it, the system much more sensitive to to seeing continuous lines. So even in this situation here, where all of the lines are, you know, they're not quite horizontal in the in the bottom example. Um, Things are not quite horizontal, um, but it'll end up seeming like this. The, all of those neurons end up being pretty active um, uh, because, well, they're both getting an input that's kind of close to what what they're looking for, um, but um, but it's also because of this lateral excitation um, they end up treating it and end up sort of um, uh, being as active as if they had a, just seeing a perfectly good horizontal line. Um, the idea for this is this seems this is probably going to be useful for picking out continuous lines, which, as we noted in the last lecture, is something that um, human visual systems seem to be pretty good at, or all mammals. Okay, so lateral connections seem like something that biology seems to be doing in there. Um, what other interesting things are going on there? Um, 
I mentioned last class that we do have um, neurons in V1 that are sort of near physically nearby each other in V1 that are sensitive to either is this data from coming in from your left eye or coming in from your right eye. Um, and the idea, one idea is a, seems to be useful for a lot of things. One big idea that seems to be incredibly useful for is that might be useful for depth perception. Um, if you are looking at an object, um, so you have two eyes and you're looking um, at an object at a particular distance, um, objects that are farther away, um, so, so the thing that you're looking at is going to be at the center of both of your eyes, fine, but objects that are farther away from you um, are going to, to appear at different locations um, on your retina. Um, and so you want, and so if you can do that, or, and also objects that are nearer from you um, are going to be uh, displayed at different locations on your retina. And so if you have ways of having neurons sort of compare, oh hey look, I'm still I'm seeing the same sort of input or as you are, but we're at a different location, um, then we might be able to have neurons that are sensitive to oh am I is am I getting something that's far away or are you getting something that's near? Okay. Um, and that is, is exactly the sort of things that we can see, um, uh, that we end up seeing um, just by doing that comparison. Um, so same features. So these are neurons that are looking for the same feature, but are at different locations in space. Um, and so that can then be, be um, the only time that they're, the most common time that that would happen is if something um, is actually near to you um, or farther away from you. Of course, um, getting that sort of data um, about things being near and far isn't the only way that people get near and far. You can work perfectly good at figuring out whether things are near and far, even with you have one eye closed. If I show you this scene, you can tell me pretty darn easily <laughs> that, all right, that car over there is really far away and this car is closer. I don't need depth perception for I don't sorry I don't need binocular vision I don't need two eyes to figure that out. Um, exactly how that sort of process is done is definitely an interesting ongoing lines of research. There seems to be lots of great data about um, expected sizes of objects, um, whether objects occlude one another, um, uh, and also sort of straight lines. Um, um, giving interesting things and whether texture, you know, um, as textures um, get farther away, the details get finer and finer. Um, lots of interesting cues that people can have tried using to try to figure out depth from an image like that. Um, there's some really, really cool models out there. My feeling on most of that research is that um, there's lots of interesting computer vision techniques that aren't particularly biologically um, uh, that, that aren't tied particularly well to biology. Um, so I think there's, a, there's a definitely a lot of, you know, potential for research about exactly how the brain is, is doing this sort of depth information. Um, um, but uh, it seems to be also something uh, pretty important. Um, and in particular, one big important thing is this issue of contours. And that's the place where we at least have some good ties to biology. Um, because it seems like uh, visual cortex ends up being really interested in who owns these lines. What do I mean by that? Um, so these lines that uh, V1 is detecting, okay, so I might have, um, so I have this visual scene, um, and I have neurons, as I've described, that are sort of, oh, okay, I've got maybe, maybe there's a neuron that's sensitive to horizontal lines at this location where this red, this top red dot is on the panda's head, or sorry, koala's head. Um, and so in V1, I would probably have a feature, a neuron that is quite active because it's sensitive to this location here. Um, but the really interesting thing that the later parts of the visual system are going to get interested in is, well, hold on a second, fine, that's a line there. Is that line part of this object back here? So this object back here, is it shaped like this? Or is this line part of this object up here, which is sort of shaped like the panda, like the koala's head? 
Um, and there seems to be all sorts of interesting data in, um, certainly as we get to this uh, V2, the sec second layer um, of visual cortex, or sorry, the second step in the higher in the visual hierarchy, um, that you start having having neurons that are sensitive to that difference. Um, and trying to figure out, given all of this sort of contour information, can I figure out, oh, this is an interesting shape here, or wherever these shapes are. Um, and it's an interesting kind of tricky puzzle. Um, especially when you've got situations like, okay, well, this this dot here, which is on the leg here, um, you know, uh, is this line, uh, sorry, this top one, you can maybe come up with some ideas of, oh, hey, look, well, this background is really, really fuzzy. Fuzzy things tend to be in the background, um, so therefore this line is part of a foreground object. Um, that doesn't work all the time, because I've got this one here, where I've got, hey, look, this is a line that's part of the leg. Um, both sides of it are pretty much as fuzzy as each other. Um, we've also got some interesting one. This one, this point here where the uh, the tree is coming up here. Um, uh, so this line here, um, uh, is it part of the tree or is it part of the koala? <laughs> um, uh, tricky to, to pick out exactly these differences. Um, there's lots of, there, at least there's several network models out there, um, definitely involving a lot of these lateral and feedback connections. Um, no particularly predominant theory that has um, really sort of nailed this sort of down. Uh, but it seems to be something that the biology gets um, uh, wanting to do pretty soon after figuring out these edges. Um, and turns out to be somewhat difficult to do. Um, as another way of sort of highlighting why this is, or some, an issue about why this might be harder than one thinks it is, because um, I think it was definitely surprising to me when I'm learning about this stuff about, oh, okay, it is really difficult to, you know, you've got a bunch of lines, group them together somehow and figure out how to make objects out of them. Um, another aspect of this problem um, is uh, sometimes referred to as the aperture problem. Um, we have these neurons that are sensitive and these features that are sensitive to pretty small little areas all right that's the data that we have from these features um, and they might be sensitive to lines at a particular angle they might be sensitive to motion in a particular direction um, those are the sorts of features that, that they can pick out um, but there's a problem if that's what you're detecting if you're detecting motion in a particular direction um, and you're sort of sensitive to these lines in this local area, um, it's tricky to figure out which way something is moving. So this little splotch over here, um, what direction is it moving in? If this is actually sort of part of a, a larger object, all right, that just has some sort of hash, some sort of striped pattern on it, if that object is moving directly to the right, I would see this, but that would also be the true if it was moving diagonally down. I would also see exactly the same thing. Right. Um, uh, indeed, even if I, you know, um, you know, moving, uh, moving directly down. Um, so the actual, the 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 that's going to be hard to figure out if just from a bunch of these small um, patches, so, okay, from this object, I know, uh, sorry, from this patch or a, a neuron that's sensitive to this feature um, might tell me that it's moving in this direction. Um, but then a neuron that's sensitive over here um, uh, might be telling me a very different direction. Um, and indeed, in general, when we have an object that is moving to the right, um, what's gonna end up happening is it's gonna seem like this part is moving this way, and this part is moving this way, and this part is moving that way. Right? If you're just looking at one very, very, very small patch right around there, and that's all you see is this one small patch, um, you can't distinguish the right way motion from up. So when, when you combine all of these things together into one large object, and then you want to figure out what direction is that object moving, given all this sort of local which direction is moving, uh, things moving, um, you need to sort of combine that in together um, somehow. Um, and it turns out that just averaging together all that information doesn't seem to actually work. 
um, uh, but um, uh, so again interesting things that people are still exploring and trying to make it work out um, cool so weird stuff about um, what's happening in v1 but that's sort of what we know um, and the one ask one hope is that the things that we just commented about some of them are at least vaguely familiar to what's going on with artificial neural networks um, so certainly with the um, with the perceptron there, there was a lot of similarities to this perceptron a lot of the structures that we're talking about there are hey look there's a bunch of input we're doing some weighted sums we're doing some and then the total of that weighted sum tells me how active this feature is cool that seems you know feature neuron use those interchangeably that seems exactly what's going on here but this sort of system um, the uh, with the perceptron on itself we weren't doing any of the feature learning that we see in v1 where v1 um, uh, seems to pick up on features that are useful given the environment that it's given um, none of these sorts of lateral connections that i just talked about that seem to be very dominant in the visual uh, system um, oh and in perceptrons it's not typical to um, have the feature be something about movement or about being transient sort of you know with a static input um, you will suddenly see an input and then it'll go or you will get a response but then it'll go away um, if the input doesn't change um, so those are things that we don't tend to see with perceptrons um, with confnets okay cool we definitely get this learning of or actually any deep deep network or any multi-layer perceptron we definitely do get the learning aspect we get um, that is sort of um, that would be similar to what seems to be happening in v1 as v1 learns to combine the information that's coming in from the retina to become useful features i.e these lines um, there's also the fact that um, in the visual cortex um, it seems to be doing very similar things at lots of different points in the visual field um, this is part of why there's so many neurons in the visual um, cortex um, just because it's doing this in, in lots and lots and lots of places um, of course it's a little bit different in that in confnets that we're used to we're used to sort of a nice regular grid of the image um, whereas uh, in biology we have many many much more information about the center of the field of view than we do um, uh, anything around the periphery um, but we also get this nice thing of this okay you get features that build on features that build on features that's that part's pretty nice um, and we do also get this emphasis with the confnets about hey there's something special about local features we're not just combining data from all over the visual field um, we're combining data mostly about local areas of the visual field um, again those things tend to be working with static inputs um, they tend not to have any of this sort of um, adaptation um, uh, sort of um, uh, or I guess the, the more interesting thing there is um, they tend not to have any of these uh, connections uh, sorry um, lateral connections between the features um, um, although things like normalization are sometimes being uh, sometimes added to convolutional networks uh, like it's kind of close to it um, but that sort of structure is there um, with the hot field networks um, that's the only artificial neural network we've talked about that use or I guess the hot field networks and the Kahona networks are the only ones that are using lateral connections um, and the hot field network also is a very good thing is this is this is about dynamics this is about okay we're gonna feed in an input and then we're gonna wait a while and see what it settles down into um, but if it's feeding in static inputs um, and it doesn't really have any sort of hierarchy um, um, or really any sort of extracting of more information features or more interesting features from um, other ones um, and lastly the Conan map the Conan networks that we talked about um, definitely the, the, they have good retinotopic organization um, also has good lateral connections has some nice things about this these orientation spirals that um, also map incredibly well into, into v1 um, but people tend not to be using them in some sort of hierarchical fashion and um, they tend also not to be using them for particular computational functions 
So, quite a mismatch of things in there. There seems to be a lot of hints of oh, all of these things seem really close to what Vision is doing, um, but whatever it is that biological vision is doing seems to be all of this and more. Um, and it could just be that in order to really understand, you know, in order to really understand what the hex vision is doing, maybe we just need to make larger and larger networks that are sort of combining together more and more of these things. Um, and so that's at least one possible um, uh, direction um, that people are hoping for. Um, but actually figuring out how to integrate all these things is kind of tricky um, in topics of ongoing research. Um, speaking of things that you might want to possibly do with any of this stuff, um, uh, just even building a simple model that does that little bit of contour detection that I was talking about. Um, uh, so, you know, extracting feature, you know, doing features like a normal neural network, but then adding in these lateral connections and seeing, hey, does that help for uh, particular types of inputs? You know, so it's adding lateral connections between neurons that detect similar features, but at different points of the visual space. Um, so, uh, so that's one thing. There's other sorts of, there are some different papers out there that people have added normalization or um, adaptation um, to uh, convolutional networks um, and trying to see whether or not that, um, you know, are there situations where that helps. Um, and, and then even just doing this, this straightforward of, all right, train up a convolutional network and then look at what those early feature maps are. Do, how well do they map onto the actual data from biology? Um, is it more that people are sort of like, yeah, yeah, that looks kind of close or is it, um, or how similar is it? Um, cause there's a lot of good data for both from the biology and easy to train up neural networks. Um, and, and there's definitely similarities and differences in there. Cool. Um, that's it for this part of this lecture. Um, there's going to be a second part, which will go up to slightly higher level vision stuff. Okay. See you then.